Once again we find ourselves in the missing abyss. In this second volume of the series, I've tried to choose some of the strangest missing persons cases I could find. So without further ado, let's get stuck into these unsolved mysteries together in The Missing Abyss, Volume 2. Branson Perry. On April 11, 2001, Branson Perry stepped outside his home to return jumper cables to the shed. The 20-year-old then inexplicably disappeared from his own yard, never to be seen again. Born on February 24, 1981, Branson Kane Perry grew up in Missouri, graduating from Nottoway Holt High School in 1999. After working as a roofer, he lost his job and temporarily joined a traveling petting zoo while searching for new employment. Living with his father, Bob Perry, at 304 West Oak Street, Branson faced the challenge of tachycardia, a condition accelerating his heart rate. Despite this, he remained active, boasting a black belt in Hapkido and a passion for weightlifting. His life was relatively uneventful until the pivotal day in 2001. On April 7, 2001, Branson Perry paid a visit to his neighbor Jason Bierman, who allegedly provided him with an unidentified drug. Branson's reaction to the drug included stripping naked and engaging in a peculiar dance within Jason's residence. Subsequently, he proceeded to shave off his pubic hair and partake in what was described as sexual activity with Jason. With sobriety and a sense of humiliation the following day, Branson recounted the incident to his father, who, in turn, expressed fury. Although harboring suspicions about his son's sexual orientation, the elder Perry was reportedly incensed at Jason for allegedly drugging and using Branson, contemplating the idea of teaching him a lesson. Despite the intense emotions, no confrontation materialized. Curiously, Jason has never been officially designated as a primary suspect in the case, and any response, if at all, to Branson's vanishing remains unclear. What is undisputed is that Branson and his friend Gina Crawford were engaged in house cleaning while his father, Bob Perry, was hospitalized. Simultaneously, two mechanics were outside replacing Bob Perry's alternator. Without warning, Branson abruptly seized an item from a cabinet and stepped outside, returning without divulging the nature of his errand. Following the completion of their cleaning tasks, Gina took a shower and later noticed one of the mechanics searching a kitchen cabinet. When inquired about his quest, he dismissed it as insignificant and returned outdoors. Gina, while resting upstairs, glanced out the window around 3 p.m. Observing Branson leaving the house, she called out questioning, Branson, what are you doing? Branson responded, I'm going to put away the jumper cables, then run out for a bit. I'll be back in a few minutes. Little did anyone know it marked the final time he would be seen. With Branson's father still in the hospital for a few more days, his grandmother Joanne Stinnett visited on April 12th, inquiring if Branson had come by the night before. His father, however, confirmed no visit. Initially dismissing the concern, as Branson had visited nightly, Joanne later visited the Perry home, discovering open doors and Branson absent. Growing alarmed, she sought information in town, but no one had seen him. On April 16, 2001, she, along with his parents, approached the police to file a missing persons report. The prolonged silence and the abandonment of all his personal belongings, coupled with the unusual behavior, immediately raised suspicions of foul play. Sheriff Ben Espe of Nottoway County initiated the search for Branson by meticulously canvassing a 15-mile radius around Skidmore. A comprehensive investigation ensued, involving interviews with numerous individuals, including Branson's drug acquaintances. Despite rigorous questioning and polygraph tests, all those interviewed passed, leaving the authorities without any concrete leads into Branson's disappearance. The mystery surrounding his whereabouts persisted, shrouded in uncertainty. However, in 2003, a potential suspect emerged under unsettling circumstances. The sequence of events unfolded when Jack Wayne Rogers, a former Presbyterian minister and Boy Scouts leader, faced arrest for offenses unrelated to Branson. Rogers was charged with first-degree assault and practicing medicine without a license after a failed attempt at performing sex reassignment surgery on a trans woman resulted in severe bleeding. Upon searching his possessions, authorities uncovered evidence of more disturbing activities unrelated to the initial charges. Among the findings were instances of child pornography and deeply troubling online posts attributed to usernames like Buggerbutt. These posts detailed acts of sexual assault, torture, and murder involving several men. In certain instances, Rogers even discussed the disturbing idea of cannibalizing severed genitals. Perhaps the most alarming revelation was the online post describing the murder of a blonde hitchhiker and the subsequent burial in the Ozarks. When questioned, Jack Wayne Rogers insisted the post was a work of fiction and denied any acquaintance with Branson. However, authorities discovered a turtle claw necklace in Rogers' car, closely resembling one of Branson's necklaces. Despite this, it fell short of constituting concrete evidence. In 2004, Rogers faced convictions for assault, illegal surgery, child pornography, and obscenity. 
he received a 17-year sentence for assault, 7 years for illegal surgery, and 30 years for child pornography and obscenity. Yet there was no confirmation of his involvement in Branson's disappearance. Despite the legal proceedings, Branson's mother, seeking answers about her son, eventually became convinced of Roger's innocence in his abduction. She stated, In my heart I don't believe this suspect is responsible. Unfortunately, the Perry family has endured significant losses over the past two decades. Perry's father passed away in 2004 and his mother succumbed to melanoma in 2011. Despite these tragedies, in April 2019, Nodaway County Sheriff Randy Strong expressed the unwavering commitment of authorities to solve the case. He emphasized the importance of justice and closure for the remaining members of Branson's family. Sheriff Strong believes that Branson was murdered while in the company of a group of individuals he knew, particularly emphasizing the influence of the drug culture. The challenge lies in extracting information from individuals unwilling to cooperate, making it difficult to locate Branson's body. Prior to Branson's mother's passing, she had reserved an empty plot next to her grave for her son, holding on to hope even as authorities persisted in their search. In 2022, Sheriff Strong affirmed that they do have a suspect and would promptly collaborate with the prosecutor's office once enough evidence on them was obtained. The case remains unsolved to this day, and Branson's whereabouts is still unknown. Jason Jolkowski Born on June 24, 1981 in Grand Island, Nebraska, Jason Jolkowski was the son of Jim and Kelly, with a younger brother named Michael. Described as shy, intelligent, and kind by acquaintances, Jason pursued part-time studies at Iowa Western Community College in Council Bluffs, Iowa. He harbored dreams of becoming a radio DJ in the future, while also holding a job at the local Italian restaurant, Fazoli's. On June 13, 2001, while enjoying his summer vacation at his family's Omaha, Nebraska home, 19-year-old Jason received a phone call requesting him to start work early. Facing the challenge of not having his car available at the auto repair shop, he reached out to a co-worker and arranged to meet her at Benson High School, roughly half a mile from his residence. From there, she was supposed to drive him to Fazoli's. Regrettably, Jason never made it to their meeting point. The last sighting of Jason was by a neighbor named Chester Link, who observed him assisting his younger brother Michael in returning the garbage cans to the garage. Following this, Jason walked in the direction of the school around 10.45 a.m. on that morning. As time passed without his arrival, the co-worker phoned his residence between 11.15 and 11.30 a.m., searching for him, but he was nowhere to be found. The eight blocks separating the Jolkowski residence and Benson High School comprised quiet residential streets with minimal traffic. Reviewing security camera footage from Benson High School confirmed that Jason did not make it to the school that day. Jason's parents opted to delay reporting him missing until the subsequent morning under the mistaken belief that it was necessary to wait a full 24 hours before involving the police. Authorities initially assumed Jason was just another teenage runaway, delaying the commencement of their investigation until 10 days after his disappearance. However, family and friends were steadfast in their conviction that Jason wouldn't have run away. They emphasized that his family held paramount importance to him, and his life was on a positive trajectory. His parents depicted Jason as considerate and generous someone who went out of his way to assist others. It is believed that on that day, Jason had only his cell phone and no more than $60 on him. No other items were missing from his bedroom. Despite conducting interviews with friends, family, neighbors, and co-workers, the police were unable to explain the circumstances surrounding Jason's disappearance. No additional sightings of him emerged, and the lack of forensic or circumstantial evidence left the case with an air of perplexity as if he had vanished without a trace. Descriptions of Jason portrayed him as having no interest in partying and no known involvement with alcohol or drugs throughout his life. Subsequent to his disappearance, there was no activity recorded on either his bank account or cell phone. No suspects have been identified in this case, and his co-worker was early on ruled out as a person of interest. So what on earth transpired to cause Jason to vanish during daylight hours within such a narrow time frame? What could possibly have happened to him to make him disappear like that? An officer involved in the investigation was quoted as saying that Jason's disappearance was the most baffling case he had encountered in 30 years. In a scenario void of witnesses or any evidence, speculation becomes the only recourse to understand what might have unfolded. The prevailing theory, also supported by Jason's family, posits that he was enticed into a vehicle by someone on that fateful day and subsequently met with foul play. Responding to their son's disappearance, Jim and Kelly Jolkowski established Project Jason, a nonprofit organization aimed at assisting the families of missing individuals. Their advocacy efforts led to the passage of Jason's law by the Nebraska legislature in 2005, resulting in the creation of a statewide database for missing persons. 
In recognition of her contributions, Kelly received a Volunteer for Victims Award from U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder and the Nebraska Governor's Points of Light Award. As per the Omaha Police Department, the investigation into Jason's disappearance remains open and active, yet it stands as a cold case with no promising leads. In 2021, the Jolkowski family, accompanied by Jason's friends, gathered at a park to somberly mark the 20th anniversary of his vanishing. Reflecting on the passage of time, Jason's mother, Kelly Murphy, shared, Unfortunately, with this mark, I will have not had him more years than I had him in my life since he disappeared at the age of 19. He was almost 20, but he was 19. That's just hard to fathom. 20 years, that's two decades. Despite the ongoing struggle with the void left by Jason's absence, his family maintains hope that someday they'll attain closure and obtain definitive answers about his fate. Hope is your right until you know the truth, added Jason's mom. Some people try to take hope away from you. They think, well, you should be over that by now. You should be back to normal. Everyone deserves hope. Richard Patron Jr. and Danielle Imbo Richard Patron Jr. and Danielle Imbo enjoyed an evening at a Philadelphia bar with their friends Anthony and Michelle. As the night progressed, they declined Anthony and Michelle's invitation to go elsewhere, citing early morning commitments. At 11.45 p.m. on February 19, 2005, Richard and Danielle left the bar and headed to Richard's vehicle. After that moment, they vanished without a trace. Growing up in the same Philadelphia neighborhood, Danielle and Richard had a close connection. Despite losing touch over the years, Danielle maintained a close relationship with Richard's sister, Christine. Danielle's life took a turn when she met and fell in love with Joe Imbo. Their marriage resulted in the birth of a son, Joe Jr., but their relationship was marked by turbulence. During a period when Danielle and their baby were unwell, Joe attended the Super Bowl in Houston where he met another woman on the plane. Upon his return, he informed Danielle of his desire for a divorce, a decision she reluctantly accepted, leading to a devastating period in her life. As the stress of the divorce proceedings took its toll, Danielle experienced significant weight loss and developed a chain-smoking habit. During this challenging time, Richard re-entered her life. A devoted single father with a 14-year-old daughter named Angela, Richard's affection for Danielle became evident as Angela later revealed that Danielle was the first girl her father genuinely cared for and wanted to spend time with. Amidst the complexities of her divorce, Danielle requested that Richard maintain some distance, a request he honored despite feeling hurt. Joe's brief rebound relationship came to an end, and he found himself pleading with Danielle for a second chance. Recognizing that divorce was the necessary course of action, Danielle decided to end the relationship with her controlling and short-tempered soon-to-be ex-husband. On February 19, 2005, Richard, having dined alone, felt the desire to experience live music. Unable to join him, Christine, Richard's sister, was with Danielle and conveyed the invitation to her. Given that Joe had custody of their child that night, Danielle accepted Richard's offer. Residing across the bridge in New Jersey at that time, Richard picked her up and took her to Abilene's bar and restaurant. Anthony and Michelle joined them as they enjoyed a live band performance. Throughout the evening, Danielle and Richard shared intimate moments, exchanging several kisses. The night concluded just before midnight as they bid farewell to their friends and headed to Richard's 2001 Black Dodge Dakota. The subsequent day, Danielle failed to make her hair appointment, and both her and Richard's phones went unanswered, going straight to voicemail. Concerned, Danielle's brother John visited her house to check on her. Initially, everything appeared normal, but the absence of her response to calls raised alarms. Joe arrived at 3 p.m. to drop off their baby, only to be met by several members of Danielle's family. They informed him that Danielle was not around and asked John to look after Joe Jr. until her return. John and Richard Patron Sr. took to their cars and meticulously combed through every street, side street, and alleyway spanning from Philadelphia to Mount Laurel. They traversed the three bridges leading out of the city and inspected waterways for any signs of Richard's vehicle. At sunrise, they returned home to regroup, their search efforts yielding no tangible results. Volunteers coordinated a grid search, spanning a hundred miles in all directions, distributing images of Richard's truck and license plate. Subsequently, law enforcement became actively involved. Investigators disclosed that there had been no activity on their cell phones, credit cards, or bank accounts since their departure from Abilene's. Exhaustively, toll bridge cameras linking Philadelphia to New Jersey were scrutinized, revealing no evidence of Danielle and Richard making it out of the city. One hypothesis proposes that they accidentally drove into the Delaware River, prompted by a tip from a local waitress who noticed what seemed like a vehicle passing through a broken gate near the water. A thorough search was initiated in the vicinity, with divers uncovering several vehicles. Yet Richard's Dodge Dakota remained elusive. Alternatively, the possibility of a carjacking and subsequent murder has been considered. In 2004, 
13,000 vehicles were reported stolen in Philadelphia, often ending up in chop shops, potentially explaining the challenges in locating the Dodge Dakota. The FBI and Philadelphia Stolen Car Squad conducted an investigation but found no evidence supporting the carjacking theory. Given the puzzling nature of the disappearance, some individuals close to the case speculated that it could be a murder-for-hire scenario. Causing the disappearance of two individuals without leaving a trace is a daunting task, indicative of the work of a highly skilled and experienced perpetrator. While Anthony and Michelle initially drew suspicion as the last people to have seen the missing couple alive, they were swiftly cleared of any wrongdoing. The same cannot be said for Joe, however. Despite having an alibi confirming his presence 50 miles away from Philadelphia on the evening of the disappearance, Joe's pre-disappearance conduct raised suspicions. He had knowledge of Danielle's voicemail password and accessed it multiple times before February 19th. Additionally, he made numerous threatening calls to Richard's home and workplace, cautioning him to stay away from his wife. Despite these troubling actions, there exists no concrete evidence linking him to the disappearances, and he vehemently denies any involvement. Joe underwent a polygraph test, but the results proved inconclusive. In 2021, the FBI disclosed having promising new leads, though no additional information has since been provided. It's baffling to imagine two people vanishing in the middle of a city and leaving no trace. No CCTV footage, no cell phone pings, nothing, but somehow that's exactly what happened. The case remains unresolved to this day. Bryce Laspisa, raised in Naperville, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Bryce David Laspisa was the only child of a small yet affectionate family. Described as intelligent, happy, and outgoing, Bryce displayed early artistic talent, finding joy in drawing. Additionally, he was an enthusiastic gamer with a particular fondness for playing Xbox, excelling in academics and earning the admiration of his peers. Bryce was a well-liked individual. The Laspisa family, characterized by closeness, believed Bryce felt comfortable sharing anything with his parents. Or at least that's what they thought. Following their retirement, Karen and Michael Laspisa made the decision to relocate to California. Subsequently, upon Bryce's high school graduation in 2012, the family moved to Laguna Niguel, an affluent beach town in Orange County. Embarking on a new chapter, Bryce left home and enrolled at Sierra College in Rockland, located approximately seven hours north of Laguna Niguel. His focus was on studying graphic and industrial design. During his initial term, Bryce formed a relationship with a fellow student named Kim Sly. However, concerns arose in the summer of 2013 when Kim and Bryce's close friend and roommate Sean noticed his frequent heavy drinking, sparking worry for his well-being. At the age of 19, Bryce started using Vyvanse, an amphetamine commonly prescribed for ADHD and binge eating disorder. The source of the medication, for which he lacked a prescription, remained unclear. Reportedly, Bryce began taking the psychostimulant to extend his gaming sessions into the late hours of the night. Vyvanse comes with potential side effects, including headache, dizziness, racing heart, hallucinations, nausea, trouble sleeping, and irritability. Predictably, its combination with alcohol posed significant issues. By late August 2013, Bryce exhibited troubling and uncharacteristic behavior. Suddenly, Bryce presented his Xbox and a pair of diamond earrings, a gift from his mother, to his roommate Sean. Accompanying this gesture was a heartfelt yet cryptic text. I love you, bro. Seriously, you're the best person I've ever met. You saved my soul. On the same day, Bryce ended his relationship with Kim, expressing to her that she would be better off without him. Apparently, Bryce harbored something he intended to share with his parents and planned to drive home. Concerned, Kim took his keys and reached out to the Las Pisas to convey her worries, suggesting he shouldn't be driving. Bryce took the phone and asserted that Kim was upset about their breakup. Recalling part of their conversation, Karen, Bryce's mom, shared, I said, Bryce, I'm worried. Let me come up there tomorrow. Let me fly up there tomorrow. And he says, Mom, no, don't make any airline reservations until I talk to you because I have a lot to talk to you about. Regrettably, Karen and Michael never learned what Bryce intended to discuss. Despite Bryce's assurance that he was fine, Karen persuaded Kim to return his keys. He left at 11.30 p.m., stating that he was heading back to his apartment. During the early hours of August 29th, Karen missed a call from Bryce. Initially assuming he was just updating her about his return to his apartment, it later emerged that his cell phone pinged far from his usual residence. At 11 o'clock a.m., the Las Pisas received a call from their insurance company, revealing that Bryce had sought roadside assistance earlier that morning. Bryce's predicament arose as he had run out of gas in Buttonwillow, a midway point between his apartment and the family's home in Laguna Niguel. Christian, an employee from Castro Tire and Truck Services, had delivered three gallons of gas to Bryce at 9 a.m. At this juncture, Bryce's parents presumed he was en route home. However, by noon, with no sign of Bryce, Karen contacted the insurance company, 
seeking contact information for Christian. Gratefully, he agreed to return to Button Willow and check on Bryce. Upon inspection, Christian found Bryce in the same location as hours before, his eyes appearing somewhat red. Bryce assured Christian he would be home by 3 p.m. When Bryce failed to appear by the promised time, Karen attempted to reach him multiple times but received no response. Concerned and with several hours passing without any word from Bryce, his parents reported him missing at 6 p.m. Upon pinging Bryce's cell phone, the police discovered he was still located in Button Willow, parked on the side of the road, merely eight miles from his previous known location. Deputy Hernandez engaged in conversation with Bryce, expressing the deep concern of his parents who had reported him missing. Bryce appeared coherent and in good condition, asserting that he was simply taking a moment to relax and release stress by sitting there. Notably, he successfully completed a field sobriety test. Upon inquiry about drugs or alcohol in his Toyota Highlander, Bryce denied having any and consented to a vehicle search. Law enforcement found nothing illegal or suspicious among Bryce's possessions, deeming him fit to continue his journey. However, they requested him to speak with his mother first. When Karen questioned Bryce about his activities, he explained that he was merely putting his belongings back into his SUV after the officer's search. According to Karen, Bryce claimed he was there because he had plans to meet up with friends. The identity of these friends and the reason for a prolonged wait remained yet another unknown. With the assumption that Bryce would soon drive home, the deputies departed. On that night, Christian noticed a missed call from Karen, prompting him to return the call and discover that Bryce had not yet made it home. Concerned, he offered to search for Bryce once more and provide an update. Eventually, he located Bryce precisely where the police officers had left him. Christian advised Bryce to commence his journey home, proposing to tail him in his own car. Bryce agreed, and Christian followed him for 10 miles before pulling over to inform Karen that her son was now on Interstate 5 and en route. At 12.30 a.m., Bryce stopped to refuel and purchase a soda. 20 minutes later, Karen called him, but he didn't answer. By 1.50 a.m., his parents called again, and this time he picked up. However, Bryce evaded their questions and refused to disclose his exact location, citing darkness and the absence of visible landmarks. To alleviate their concerns, Bryce mentioned that, according to his GPS, he anticipated arriving home at 3.25 a.m. In a final conversation at 2.09 a.m., Bryce informed his parents that he was tired and intended to pull over for a nap. Considering his lack of sleep for at least a day, they deemed this a reasonable idea. The Las Pisas were awoken the next morning by the doorbell, anticipating Bryce's return. Instead, a California Highway Patrol officer stood at their door. Inquiring about a 2003 beige Toyota Highlander, they confirmed it was their son's vehicle. The officer revealed that the car was found abandoned at the bottom of a 25-foot embankment near Castaic Lake at 5.30 a.m. It lay on its side with a broken rear windshield, suggesting Bryce might have shattered it to exit the SUV after the crash. Surprisingly, his wallet, cell phone, and laptop remained inside, along with two small drops of Bryce's blood, one on the passenger seat headrest and the other in the back seat. The presence of minimal blood suggested possible minor injuries, though the chance of internal injuries couldn't be ruled out. Strangely, the only missing element was Bryce himself. An unzipped duffel bag was discovered nearby, leading investigators to believe he had opened it before departing. The mystery lingered regarding what he might have taken with him and why he left crucial items behind. An analysis of the tire tracks uncovered a troubling aspect of the accident. Bryce had accelerated while descending the hill, prompting speculation about whether the crash was intentional. The search operation involved officers on foot, horseback, and four-wheelers, as well as divers, bloodhounds, and cadaver dogs. Canine search teams traced Bryce's scent down Lake Hughes Road to a gas station and truck stop. Intriguingly, the trail came to an end there. Was he possibly picked up by someone? Despite days of extensive searching in and around Castaic Lake, with its maximum depth of 300 feet, neither divers nor law enforcement uncovered any trace of Bryce. The sole additional lead was security camera footage capturing Bryce driving down Lake Hughes Road at 2.15 a.m., just minutes after informing Karen about his plan to take a nap. Another sighting occurred at 4.29 a.m. on the same road. After this, his vehicle did not appear on camera again. On September 4, 2013, a few days following Bryce's disappearance, police responded to reports of a fire near Castaic Lake, in proximity to Bryce's last known location. Upon arrival, they shockingly discovered charred human remains. Despite widespread anticipation that these remains belonged to Bryce, subsequent determination revealed that they did not. Expressing dissatisfaction with the handling of their son's case as it progressed with no leads, the Las Pisas enlisted the services of a private investigator. Regrettably, her endeavors also yielded no new evidence. 
However, the investigator proposed the likelihood that Bryce had suffered a head injury during the accident, leading to amnesia or a fugue state, causing him to wander away disoriented. In 2015, Karen and Michael enlisted a sonar specialist to conduct an additional search of Castaic Lake, but this too failed to yield any pertinent information related to Bryce's case. Over the years, numerous unconfirmed sightings of Bryce were reported from states like Oregon, California, and Texas. However, since his disappearance, there has been no activity on Bryce's bank account, credit cards, social security number, or passport. Initially, the police entertained the possibility that Bryce might have taken his own life, given his behavior leading up to the disappearance, indicating potential suicidal thoughts. They also considered the scenario where he might have chosen to walk away from his life and start anew elsewhere. His parents firmly rejected the notion that their son willingly opted to escape his life and family. He never ran away from home. There was never any problem big enough that would make Bryce literally want to walk away from his life. He loved us too much and we love him too, emphasized Karen. In 2022, the Find Bryce Laspisa Facebook page reported a seemingly credible sighting of Bryce in Missoula, Montana. A photo of a man closely resembling an older, disheveled Bryce circulated online, creating a viral buzz. Detective Ethan Smith diligently pursued the lead, successfully identifying the doppelganger. Reflecting on the investigation, Smith stated, I was able to verify his identity, and it's not Bryce. I believe the photo being circulated of the young man on the bike in Missoula who looks like Bryce is this guy. But sadly, it isn't Bryce. I was astounded by the resemblance between the two. The events following Bryce's accident, as well as the factors troubling him before his disappearance, continue to shroud themselves in mystery. Despite this, law enforcement does not lean towards the theory that he succumbed to his injuries from the accident. Considering his struggles with substance abuse and reports of erratic behavior, the possibility arises that Bryce underwent a psychotic break, leading to an off-grid existence in a compromised mental state. And with the conclusion of Bryce's unsolved case, Volume 2 of The Missing Abyss comes to an end. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and drop a comment down below with your thoughts. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.